My name is David Matthews, and I was born actually at the Springdale Hospital on April the 13th, 1951. And I've lived my entire life since then in a seven mile radius of where I was born. My father was Roe Matthews. He was a Baptist preacher. He was at preaching in Springdale when I was born, and 10 days before I turned five, he moved to Lowell. He preached there for 23 years until he retired from the ministry. My mother was a school teacher, Geneva Matthews. She taught for 41 years in the Arkansas uh, public education system before she retired. Oh, uh, and tell me about your siblings and your and your family when you as you were growing up. Well, I have an older brother, uh, J. D. Matthews, who's nine years older than me, and so being nine years older, he was gone from the house by the time I was nine years old. So I don't have a lot of memories of growing up playing with him or anything of that nature, but of course I have a fond relationship with him now. My sister Deborah uh, ultimately married my best friend in high school, Craig Campbell. Uh, she was our office manager here in this law firm for over 30 years, uh, and uh, they, they're still married and still doing well. And then I have a younger brother, Stephen, who lives in Fort Worth, Texas. Thank you. Uh, so what was it like growing up in Lowell as preacher's kid? Uh, well, growing up in Lowell was wonderful. Uh, you mean, you have to, what, back in 1951 or 55 when I moved there, the, all the streets in the downtown part of Lowell were not even paved yet. Uh, we had a, a party line telephone system. It was long distance to call across the street from the parsonage to the people that lived on the other side of, of McClure. Uh, ran around, you know, there was no fear of crime, no fear of uh, people kidnapping kids. Besides that, if they'd kidnapped me, they'd have probably brought me back like the ransom of Red Chief. But it was wonderful. It was a peaceful place. But about 200 people lived in Lowell then, and we all knew each other, and all the kids, you know, played together. So, great place. Great school, too. What do you remember as a kid of Rogers? Well, Rogers was a distant place to me when I was a kid because my mother taught school in Springdale. So by nature, we went to the grocery store in Springdale. We went to the department store in Springdale. I'd you know, get my school clothes at Wilson's on Emma Avenue. So I didn't really know much about Rogers until seventh grade. Of course, in kids that went to school in Lowell uh, went to junior high and high school in Rogers. So we'd catch the bus and ride to Rogers and that's when really my knowledge of Rogers began and it really increased when I joined the DMLA chapter in Rogers. I was 13 then and so at that point my social uh, activities began to be Rogers centric rather than Springdale centric. But it, Rogers was a great place too. I, I've, I've told people for many years if I was Samantha on Bewitched and could twitch my nose and make something happen, I'd take Rogers back to 1968. Everybody knew everyone. Downtown was thriving. Beaver Lake was just coming in uh, and it was a it was a wonderful idyllic place. It was like happy days. Uh, what do you remember in those days of Bentonville? Did you go to Bentonville often? I went to the county fair in Bentonville. Uh, the fact in those days the school bus would take you uh, over to Bentonville for the county fair uh, one day uh, each year and, and that was really about the extent of my knowledge of Bentonville. We played them in football and basketball. It wasn't really until I started practicing law that I began to go to Bentonville on a regular basis and became familiar with the square and the courthouse and those things. So how did, talk about what you did after high school. Well, after high school, I went to the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. I, I continued to work, though, at the Holiday Inn in Rogers. So uh, four nights a week, I was driving back from Fayetteville to work my shift at the Holiday Inn. Uh, it wasn't until my, actually, I just about to graduate from college, and I got a job in Fayetteville at Perry's Jewelry. Uh, so uh, when I was in college, I worked. Uh, and uh, sometimes I might skip a class to play touch football, but uh, most of the time I was working and, and driving, traveling back and forth to uh, Lowell uh, for church on Sundays and uh, Sunday dinner with my folks. Then when I uh, graduated from college, uh, I got married to Mary Beth Mushholt and, and I started law school immediately. 
And so talk about that. What happened next? You finished law school? And well, uh, Mayor Beth and I ultimately were in law school together. Two years after I started, she also enrolled in law school. And I tell people we went to law school together. She graduated magna cum laude, and I graduated thank the laude. But my last year in law school, I got a job as a law clerk working for the Kelly Law Firm, more accurately working for Kelly Luffman and Jennings. At that time, it was Gene Kelly, Mac Luffman, and John uh, Jennings, who had a law office that was located literally right next door to where we're sitting uh, today. But uh, I worked, I clerked for them for a year. Uh, and then when, it, when I had graduated from law school, of course, I wanted a job. I had been working uh, my way through college and law school. I wanted a job that actually paid a salary. And uh, I asked uh, my friend Gene Kelly if he'd give me a job. And uh, he was very nice, but he then gave me the best advice I've, I've ever gotten. He said, David, you need to go back to Lowell. You grew up there. They've never had a lawyer. You know everybody there. You need to open your own office in Lowell, and you'll be a success. And I said, well, Gene, that's great advice, but there's no building available in Lowell, and I don't have two nickels to rub together to rent one or buy one. And Gene Kelly, it's un incredible to me even now, Gene Kelly said this, you go find a place to buy, and I will go with you to the First National Bank, and I'll co-sign the loan for you to start your law practice. And he did. We bought a building. Uh, in uh, downtown Lowell and the, the people in the community helped me tear down what was there and use the scrap lumber to rebuild a little two-room office and Gene, true to his word, co-signed the loan for me at First National Bank. Carl Baggett was president then and they loaned me 100% of the money to start my law office. I, it's just unheard of, such a kind and generous thing. And I'm thankful he didn't, he didn't have to pay the loan that he had co-signed. So what happened next? How'd the law practice go? Almost immediately, the law practice was a, a success. It was funny. I, I mean, I literally didn't know anything. I, my library consisted of a set of statutes that I bought for $10 a month from uh, the Mishi company. Uh, I had all of the modern conveniences, though. In my little two-room office, I had a black rotary dial telephone with a hold button. Uh, I had a correct and selectric IBM typewriter and, uh, and when I finally had enough business to justify hiring a secretary, uh, I hired Susan Bright, uh, who was wonderful, but she didn't know how to type. Now she told me that when we began, I said, well, you don't know how to type and I don't know how to be a lawyer, we'll learn together. Uh, and uh, she came to work for me and, and did a great job, worked for a number of years for first me and then for our firm. but. It was great, but you get you just crazy things happen. Though I was, I'd been a lawyer about three days, and I was sitting in my office with nobody, no secretary, just me. And a guy walks in and looks at me, and he says, "Have you got a notorious Republican here?" And I said, "Why, well, no, sir. I'm a Democrat." He said, "Oh, I don't care anything about your politics. I just need somebody to sign my car title." <laughs> And I said, oh, you mean a notary public? Yes, sir, I'm a notary public. I'll be glad to do that for you. But that was just, uh, you know, Gene was right. They'd never had a lawyer in Lowell, and nobody knew what a lawyer was supposed to do, and I didn't really know how to be one. But we got along and, and did well. Within six months, I had two secretaries working and uh, had plenty of business. I was also, though, the Lowell City Judge. Uh, in those days, uh, before Amendment 80, uh, mayor's courts were in all of the small towns and Lowell had one too and you didn't even have to be a lawyer to be a, a city court judge in a, in a mayor's court and so when I was in law school I got hired to be the judge for the city of Lowell. I was a judge before I was a lawyer uh, for about a year. I got paid ten dollars a month to come once a month and hold traffic court and I ended up having that job for uh, six years, and then I, uh, I resigned as judge when I ran for the Arkansas legislature in 1982. But it was it was wonderful. I mean, uh, I loved being a lawyer. I loved my hometown. I loved the people of Lowell, and uh, you get to you get to help people in the practice of law. Uh, talk about running for office. 
Well, the, actually, we, we, we've just had, within the last year, a reapportionment. Well, that's what happened in 1980 as well. The 1980 census was done, and so there was a reapportionment of the Arkansas legislature, and Benton County had grown enough that it was entitled to a third legislative seat. And the one that was created was brand new, no incumbent. It included, it went from War Eagle across the southern part of Benton County, took in Lowell, Cave Springs, all the way over to Gentry, Decatur, Gravit, and Sulphur Springs. It was just a big L, and it even included Centerton. Nobody running, so I announced that I would run, and nobody else, I guess, even knew the job was open because I didn't get an opponent in 1982, and I didn't get an opponent in 1984. And then I did get an opponent in 1986, but I, I won that race and then uh, ran again in 88. And at that point, I realized that uh, I really needed to be home taking care of my children rather than being in the legislature, so I didn't run again. Did you ever think about running for office again or get approached? Uh, Oh, I've been approached many, many times, but once I had uh, cut that cord, I really didn't look back. Uh, I thought, you know, I was marginally interested in what was going on, but politics has evolved and not evolved in a good way, in my opinion. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, I was a Democrat from Benton County. Dick Barclay was a Republican, represented Rogers. He was the first uh, Republican elected from Benton County to the state legislature and the other state representative at the time was Clayton Little. Clayton and Dick and I were great friends. We would carpool back and forth between Little Rock and Lowell, Bentonville and Rogers. Later Tim Hutchinson defeated uh, Clayton and so now you had two Republicans from Benton County and one Democrat. We still drove back and forth. Uh, Dick and I probably uh, didn't vote opposite of each other half a dozen times in eight years. Uh, we, we just were of like mind. Partisanship did not matter in the General Assembly in the 80s. You were worried about your constituents and your home area. Dick and Tim and I were co-sponsors of the legislation that created the Northwest Arkansas Community College that converted the college without walls from a local endeavor to now, uh, I think, the second largest two-year college in the state of Arkansas. We knew we needed it, and the people knew we needed it. So that's an example of what people can do when they're willing to work together. I think one of the highest honors that I've ever received was when the Rogers Lowell Area Chamber of Commerce created an award that's titled the Barclay Matthews Award, and they give it to public servants who work together, who understand that uh, the government service is government service for all people, not just one particular party. Uh, I was honored to be even mentioned in the same breath in an award as Dick Barkley. He was, he was a fine, fine, fine man. Uh, talk about the quorum court uh, and the county offices, how they switched you know, over the years from Democrat to Republican and how Benton County kind of led the state in that, you know, switch from blue to red. Well, uh, I mentioned Dick Barkley earlier uh, and the, the line that I've always used is Dick Barkley was a Republican before Republican was cool. Uh, you know, Ivan Rose had been the state representative for Rogers and he died while in office. There was a special election uh, called and Gene Kelly, my old friend Gene, was the Democratic nominee. Dick Barclay was the Republican nominee, and they both ran in, uh, in primary elections to get the nomination. I think the whole world thought that Gene would win because the Democrat always won, but Dick rolled him up. I think Dick got about 60% of the vote, and uh, he, he really, Dick Barclay, in my view, started the Republican Party in Benton County because when people saw that you know a Republican could win, then they began to say, we don't have to just vote in the Democratic primary. Uh, most people don't know this. In the 1980s, the Democrats had all of the polling places. Republicans had only a few polling places because the parties had to pay for their primary election locations. So the Republican committee asked the Democrat committee if it would consider jointly hosting the primaries, and the Democrat Central Committee agreed to do it working together, the whole thrust being, 
let's make it easy for people to vote. Let's make it convenient for people to vote. Let's make it affordable for people to have elections. And so the process of joint polling places where you go in and say, I want a Republican ballot or I want a Democrat ballot, that started in the 80s after Dick Barclay had been elected to the legislature. And once that happened, the, the trend started. And so that, of course, spilled over to other things. The Quorum Court in the early 80s, when I first started practicing law in 1976, was all Democrat except for, I think, one, maybe one Republican. Dale Rice, I think, was the, was the lone Republican on the Quorum Court. Now, in 2022, it's 100% Republican. I don't believe there's a Democrat on the Benton County Quorum Court. That's just sort of been a change. But my wife served on the quorum court one term. She was appointed to fill a vacancy. My partner, George Rhodes, uh, ran for the quorum court and was elected and served several terms. Uh, Dwayne Kirby, my, my old friend uh, and the, the guy that built my law office, he served on the Benton County quorum court. Uh, it, was, it was a good working bunch that took care of Benton County, and it still is. You know, the... Uh, even though it's a partisan election, the decisions that the quorum court makes are really not partisan based. They're trying to be sure that the county uh, facilities work and are appropriate, that the county roads are drivable, that the county employees are fairly compensated. Uh, that's, not, that's not a partisan issue. That's good governance. And, and I think by and large we get good governance uh, in Benton County, whether the county judge is a Democrat or a Republican. Of course, the last Democrat county judge in Benton County was Al Norwood, who was also the mayor of Lowell when I started uh, practicing law. Uh, since then, it's, of course, uh, been held by Republicans, all of whom are good folks. Who were some of the county judges that you remember back through the years? Pretty much all of them. I told you that uh, Al Norwood was the, was the county judge when I, actually after I started practicing law, I think he got elected in 1980. Uh, Rayleigh Steele had been the county judge. He actually followed, he took my seat in the Arkansas legislature when I didn't run again. Rayleigh ran for state representative. Um, Bruce Rutherford, who was a, a, a huge man physically, had been a Benton County deputy sheriff and uh, he ran for the, court, for the county judge and won and uh, served, I think, eight years, did a great job. Uh, Barry Mooring, who is our current uh, county judge, is a brilliant man. Uh, you know, he brings a vast experience from the business world into being uh, the county judge, and I think he's been a very good spokesman for Benton County. He's he's led the county through some very difficult and contentious decisions about county facilities, but he's always done it with grace and dignity and. Uh, he's had meetings throughout the county that he's gone and listened to people's compliments and complaints. And of course, of late, people are more inclined to complain than they are to compliment. But uh, I think Judge Mooring uh, does, has done and is doing a, a good job. Is the biggest issue now he faces the future of the jail or the funding of it? Or? it the, I, think, I think that the biggest issue Judge Mooring faces now is the, the, the jail, the future of the jail. Uh, you know, Benton County has grown and with it the need for jail facilities has grown. It's a huge difference. Uh, back when I started practicing law in 1976, the jail was a small building right behind the county courthouse. And if you were, there was no public defender system when I started practicing law. People can't remember that. Everybody had a right to be represented by a lawyer. And so Judge Enfield, the circuit judge, kept a list of all of the lawyers that practiced in Benton County. And you just take your turn. He'd call you up and say, you know, David, I've got a guy over in jail and he's been charged with, uh, with possession of marijuana and I, I need you to represent him. Uh, okay, judge, we didn't get paid for it. That was our obligation as lawyers to provide a defense for the indigent. And we all took, took our turns. But you'd go over to visit with a, a jail inmate and they put you in a room that was, uh, it wouldn't even qualify as a closet. They had a, a little stool that each one sat on and a fold up table that came between you. So you're sitting knee to knee and about nose to nose about that far from a person, in my case, the first person I was appointed to 
the representative had, had committed a number of burglaries. He later, would once he'd been back to jail and gotten out, he later committed a murder and was found guilty of uh, a murder and is still in prison today. But I mean, so here I am, 25 years old, sitting knee to knee, face to face with a hardened criminal in a closet. And you know, they locked the door behind you. It was a kind of a scary deal, but they'd only have about 20 or 30 inmates at a time. And now there's in the hundreds of inmates. Well, what's changed over the time where we have so many more inmates now? I know with population. population, but is it more than that? I, I don't really think so. I think it's just population and uh, with population and prosperity. And of course, Benton County is one of the most prosperous areas of the country. But with prosperity comes folks that don't always in mean they don't always mean well. They think the prosperity of others means an opportunity for them to steal something. You know, I told you I grew up in Lowell and everybody was uh, always felt safe. Last June I had a car stolen out of the garage in my home with my wife and I and two grandkids upstairs asleep. Now that would have never happened back in the 70s or 80s, but in 2021 it happened to me. And you know, it's just people that come here and say, oh, you know, every, the, all these folks that work for Walmart or sell stuff to Walmart or practice law or practice medicine, I just will help myself to some of their things. Or they get captured in the, the vortex of drugs and, and it just, it takes them down to the point that finally they can't feed their habit in illegal means and so they resort to crime. And we put them in jail. Um, let's talk about the sh county sheriffs over the years. I know you've known a lot, of, probably all of them, but can you kind of go through your, and you don't have to go on every one. But well, it's a good thing. I couldn't, I couldn't remember all of them, but there are, there are sheriffs who are memorable. Uh, for me, uh, Don Townsend comes to mind because I knew Don when he was in the CID at the Benton County Sheriff's Office and he did a great job. Uh, he ran for sheriff and was elected and, and was a, a terrific sheriff, in my opinion. Claude Penn was a good sheriff, also came up through the ranks, was a, was a uh, you know, a former deputy that uh, then became sheriff. Probably the most colorful sheriff in my time and certainly the most controversial was Andy Lee. Uh, Andy just had a way with words and an and a air for the flamboyant. It seemed like during the years that Andy was sheriff, he was constantly in the news. And then contrast that, he gets followed by a beloved Arkansas State Trooper. Keith Ferguson started his police department, his police work as a state trooper in Benton County when he was probably in his mid-twenties. About the time my generation was graduating from high school, he probably gave every boy from Rogers High School class of 1969 a traffic ticket somewhere along the way. But he was always nice about it, and, uh, and you know he gave me a ticket once when I was working at the Holiday Inn, and then Leon Clinton, his his senior state trooper, loaned me the money to pay the ticket. But Keith finished his career as a as a state trooper and retired, and then ran for sheriff. Just the complete opposite in terms of controversy or new or being in the news. Keith came in and ran an excellent sheriff's department and never made the news. He didn't, he, he did not have controversy. Uh, the, I think the sheriff's deputies all liked him and respected him. Uh, and uh, but we, we've had an excellent law enforcement uh, program in Benton County, actually throughout all the years. Even though Andy was controversial and, uh, and in the news, we had a very good sheriff's department and really always have. Uh, what about the, the new sheriff? Sheriff Holloway. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Uh, so, uh, Sean Holloway, of course, is the sheriff now, and although I have quit practicing law in the criminal field, as a result of that, I, I don't have much occasion to go to the jail. Uh, in fact, I haven't done any criminal law since the late uh, tens. Um, but I, what I hear about uh, Judge Hall or Sheriff Holloway is that he's competent and does a good job, and that the, once again that the deputies like him and respect him and, and enjoy working for him. That's the key. You know, the sheriff sets the tone for a sheriff's department, 
and if you've got someone that is uh, rude and and uh, not considerate of others, that's going to spill out into the deputies, and they're going to treat people that way. Uh, that's not Sean Holloway, based on what I've seen and heard. He's he's respectful. He treats people with respect, and he expects his officers to treat people with respect, and I think they do. And uh, what about the, the some of the prosecutors that stand out over the years? Well, there's in in my estimation, in uh, having practiced law now for 47 years, the standard by which every prosecutor ought to be measured is David Klinger. Uh, David uh, and I practiced law in the private sector for a while. He ran for prosecuting attorney as a Democrat. Uh, he defeated an old boy named Asa Hutchinson. Most people don't remember that. that was, I think that was Asa's first run for public office. He ran for sheriff. I'm sorry, he ran for prosecuting attorney as a Republican, David Klinger beat him. Klinger would, would always, he never was defeated, but he did change parties along the way. Uh, as part of this shift that we've talked about earlier, uh, the, all of the judges and the prosecutor changed parties. You know, Tom Keith, who would, was the chairman, and went from being the chairman of the Democratic Party to a Republican elected circuit judge. But David Klinger was by far the most adept prosecutor that that I ever dealt with, and I I mean I don't mean to take anything away from some of the others, uh, some of whom uh, had had some ethical problems and were removed from office. But most of the prosecutors have been have been excellent, including our current prosecutor Nathan Smith. But David Klinger was extraordinary. I, I mean he was thorough when he was prosecuting attorney. There were only three prosecutors, the chief prosecutor, David, and then he had Zolly Duncan, uh, who later became his wife and later became a circuit judge in her own right. She was a deputy prosecutor and Kevin Pollack was a deputy prosecutor. Uh, and the three of them uh, handled all of the cases. I promise you this, I've tried hundreds of lawsuits, tried hundreds of cases against some of the best lawyers in the in the state I never tried a case against a lawyer that was any better than David Klinger and I never tried a case against a lawyer that was better prepared than David Klinger he could prepare a case for trial like nobody I have ever seen he left no detail no detail untouched what are some examples you can think of well I tried a case against him for seven days uh, uh, a client of mine named David Blankenship was uh, charged with uh, uh, murder. Uh, he had been defending his property uh, on Highway 71 between Rogers and Bentville. He had an uh, auto salvage place and he was being robbed. And so he went there to, and spent the night with a gun. And a 15 year old kid came rattling around and David went out to try to apprehend him and ended up uh, shooting him. He shot him in the back and then he brought him from the ditch where he had been shot up to the front door of the of the of his business david Klinger is the one who went to the scene that night it was david Klinger who was looking at the body it was david Klinger who realized there's not one shot in the back there are two one shot in the back and one shot in the boy's elbow that was hard to see. Klinger found it, and based upon the fact that there were not one shot but two that were fired, he concluded that uh, it was more than just a self-defense shooting. We tried the case for seven days, and uh, my client uh, was convicted. Uh, and I'll say to the, I mean, he was convicted of a lesser included offense. The jury uh, believed a substantial amount of the defense's uh, case, but it was the second bullet that got him. And David Klinger is the one that found it. And he found it that night at the scene before the body had ever gone to the state medical examiner. Uh, he was, he was thorough. And that, is that not something every prosecutor would have done? No. No, I, I doubt seriously that the chief prosecutor visits the scenes of crimes in the middle of the night these days. I may be wrong, but David Klinger was all about trying to get to the truth. Uh, 
and he prepared a case better than anybody. Good. Um, <coughs> any of the other ones you can think of that stand out? Well, the first prosecutor when I when I started practicing law was a guy named Gary Kennan, and he was a very nice man and uh, uh, did a good job. Uh, then David Klinger had the job for so long, I've, I've actually forgotten all the ones that came after him. Uh, there was, of course, a, a, a prosecutor named Butler who had some uh, who had some difficulties that resulted in his resignation. But David Klinger was the was the prosecutor that will always stand out in my mind. He did the job that needed to be done, even when it was hard. And I'll give you an example. Everyone in the legal profession loved Josephine Highland. Josephine was the circuit clerk for since Moses was a road guard. She had, she had been the circuit clerk forever. But David uh, discovered that there were, some, there were some financial improprieties. I forget now the extent of what they were. But they were there. And David, who ran on the same ticket as she did, had known her his whole career too. He had the unfortunate task of uh, confronting her with what she had done and ultimately uh, prosecuting her and forcing her out of office. I know it wasn't easy for him. I know it would have been easier for him to not prosecute or, or you know, perhaps go behind the scenes and say, you know, you need to quit doing that. David had such a sense of justice and uh, such a absolute com compulsion to see that justice was done that he couldn't do that. He had to enforce the law everywhere against everybody, even people that he knew and liked. I always respected him for that. Um, what about the judges? You've known a lot of the judges, who are some of the, and some of the ones were prosecutors too. But who are some of the judges? Well, when I started when I started practicing law, we had some judges that were uh, legendary uh, in in my mind, and and still are. Uh, I've had the opportunity through forty seven years of practicing law to practice in front of lots and lots of judges, uh, and I, I'll I'll be, I will stop now and say this: we have, in my opinion, the best panel of judges in Benton County that there is in the state of Arkansas. The judges that serve us now, I would put up against any judge anywhere in the state. They are all excellent. When I began my career, we only had two judges in Benton County. You can't even comprehend that now. I think Benton County's now got seven circuit judges. When I started practice law in 1976, we had two, a circuit judge, William Enfield, and a chancery judge named Ted Coxey. Ted Coxey was legendary. He had been the prosecuting attorney for Washington County, Benton County, Carroll County, and uh, Madison County. The, those four counties made up a judicial circuit. He was the prosecutor for all four counties for over 20 years. And then as the counties grew and Benton and Carroll County became a separate circuit, he ran for prosecuting, I'm sorry, for, ran for chancery judge and was elected. You, people could not imagine this, but in, from 1976 until 1978 when he retired, he only came to Benton County two days a week. He would take default divorces on Mondays and he would schedule trials for Wednesdays. Otherwise, there was no chancery judge. Now, chancery judge, you know, that's the person who does divorces, who did uh, cases that involved real estate, cases that involved probate. That was all the chancery judge. And Benton County had a judge doing it basically a day and a half a week because when he was done with default divorces, he went back to Carroll County. It's just inconceivable now. Now we have seven judges for just Benton County alone, and they're all, all, busy as they can be. Uh, but that was Judge Coxey. He was, he was uh, notorious in his belief that children needed to be raised by their mothers, not their fathers. I had a case once where a woman had left her husband, just left him with two kids. And he had no choice but to file for divorce. And so we go over to present ourselves to take the divorce case and ask for custody of their children. And Judge Coxey whirled in his chair about midway through my examination and said, young man, 
do you know the recipe for cornbread? And my client said, well, no, sir, I don't. Divorce denied. Nobody can raise two kids that can't cook cornbread. And then he looked at him and he said, now you go home and you call that wife of yours and tell her that the judge said for her to come home and help you raise those kids. Well, he did and she did. He went home and called her. She came back and they stayed together for about another nine months and, uh, and then it came time for a divorce again. Uh, that was Judge Coxey. Judge Enfield, on the other hand, was... Uh, he set, he and Tom Budd in Washington County set the standard for judges as far as I'm concerned. Judge Enfield, people did not realize the giant that he was in Benton County. He had been a lawyer, partners with Clayton Little, and when the, when the redistricting happened that I talked about earlier, he ran for circuit judge of Benton and Carroll County and was elected. Prior to being a lawyer and a judge, Bill Enfield had been the youngest line officer in the United States Marine Corps during World War II. He was a decorated war hero, as was Clayton Little. He had served a time as the Benton County judge. There had been a vacancy, and uh, he filled it, and so basically he was the administrator of the county, and, and then of course left and practiced law. He's the lawyer that prepared the original corporate work for a little company called Walmart. Walmart. He was Sam Walton's personal lawyer. Uh, he and Sam remained friends until they both died. But Judge Enfield was a pilot. He was an accomplished pianist. He was an artist. He was a Renaissance man, and he was one tough judge. He would get lawyers would gather before court in his in his chambers and he was a great raconteur he would come out and visit and hail fellow well met nicest guy in the world great storyteller then he'd put on the robe and go in and take the bench and you didn't you wanted to watch your p's and q's because uh, he was not going to put up with any shenanigans when I first started practicing law, I went over to watch a trial because the famed Clayton Little was trying a jury case in front of Judge Enfield. And I've been a lawyer about three weeks. So I'm sitting over there watching. And about midway through the trial, Clayton Little, who was feisty, jumped up to make an objection and he did it in a, a loud way. And Judge Enfield, who had a always worked with a number two pencil, he had a pencil in his hand and he threw it down on the docket book and it hits and bounces up in the air and comes twirling down and I'm just sitting there in shock and he points at his best friend, Clayton Little, law partner, and says, now don't you do that again. I sat back and thought, oh my Lord, if he'll do that to his best friend, I don't have a chance. So I, you know, I was uh, always careful in Judge Enfield's court not to offend. Uh, any other judges that stand out? Well, the, well the, you know, they all stand out. John, John Earl Jennings, whom I uh, clerked for, uh, later became the Rogers Municipal Judge and, uh, the, and then a Chancery Judge. That He was a Chancery Judge when it got converted to being a Circuit Judge. He then ran for the Arkansas Court of Appeals and served a, a substantial part of his time there as the Chief Judge of the Arkansas Court of Appeals. Brilliant mind, brilliant judge. Uh, of course, you know David Klinger went from being a, a prosecutor to uh, being uh, a circuit judge and, and did a, a wonderful job. Uh, I told you earlier that uh, Zolly Duncan had been a deputy prosecutor uh, with David Klinger. They ultimately married, and then she ran for judge as well. Zolly Duncan uh, is a great judge. She uh, she mostly handles divorce cases, but as a circuit judge, she can also try jury trials. And so she has uh, a broad uh, understanding of the law and exposure to all, all of the various types of, of law. And she does a, a, a super job. So does John Scott. So does Doug Sarantz. Judge Scott uh, has the best command of his courtroom of anybody that I've ever seen anywhere, and I've tried lawsuits all over the state of Arkansas and in federal court. But Judge Scott 
is pleasant, he's cordial, he's respectful, but he has command. If a witness is not answering a question, it, uh, Judge Scott will let him go about three times not answering the question, and then he'll stop the proceeding. And he might say to you, Mr. Davis, do you understand the question that's being asked you? Well, yes, sir, I do. Then answer it. We've, we've been over this now three times. You need to answer the question that's asked. And if you don't do that, then I'm going to have to give you some time out to think about it. And I've seen him take witnesses off the stand and send them to the county jail to reflect upon their responsiveness. Uh, so, of course, we all know that. And so uh, a good lawyer is going to prepare his witness. Uh, you know, since Judge Scott, since I saw that happen, I've never gone to court in his court yet that I didn't say to the witness, you are at jeopardy of b losing your freedom for a while if you don't answer the questions that are asked. Don't be, don't argue with the lawyer. You answer the question. If then, if the judge asks you a question, you sure answer it, and you answer it directly. No beating around the bush. Uh, John, John is uh, in command of his courtroom. Uh, judge Serrance uh, and I practice law with each other for many, many years, and uh, he's he's been an excellent judge as well. He's he's had to make some hard decisions on child custody cases and. In, in my instance, I had a, a case that was a, a difficult probate matter uh, between brothers, and uh, he listens carefully to the testimony, takes uh, copious notes, and he doesn't hesitate to, to make his ruling. Uh, uh, as I said before, the judges we have in Benton County are as good as any judges anywhere. Uh, like everybody that's in the law, I've watched some of the more famous trials in uh, uh, in America, the O.J. Simpson trial comes to mind. I promise you, the lawyers and the judges in Benton County are way better than those lawyers and judges were. Um, talk about some of the high-profile cases maybe that you remember or some of the ones you've worked on over the years. Well, the highest profile case that I ever worked on was not tried in Benton County. It, it was a uh, it began as a class action lawsuit by a little school district in East Arkansas called Lakeview, and it challenged the funding for the uh, Arkansas public education system. Rogers and Bentonville, uh, two school districts, I represented Rogers for many years, but then Bentonville and Rogers joined together, and they uh, hired me to represent the two districts in that lawsuit. Originally, my task was to protect the funding formula that was in place because it finally was uh, basing school funding on the number of students and because Rogers and Benton were rapidly growing they needed the funding to be based upon that. The whole debate had been whether or not uh, there were you know, phantom students. I, I, I could spend more time than you or any listener would have any interest in talking about the intricacies. But along the way the nature of that lawsuit changed. Uh, a judge named Collins Kilgore in Little Rock determined that in order to judge the cons constitutionality of the Arkansas funding system, he had to look at not only the uh, equitable division of school money, but the adequacy of it as well. Adequacy meaning how much money goes into educational funding. When that ruling was made, Rogers and Bentonville changed its position and I went from supporting the law to challenging the law and those two school districts had the courage to say now that you've asked the judge the reality is we're not doing as good a job as we could do for our students if we had more adequate funding uh, and it was it was a watershed moment in education funding in Arkansas the Lakeview case uh, went to the Supreme Court three or four different times. It was the subject of two or three special sessions of the Arkansas legislature. But Arkansas went from dead last in every meaningful ranking uh, in education uh, circles to uh, ahead of all of its neighboring states in teacher salaries, in, uh, in uh, achievement levels. We haven't yet been able to crack the need to have more people in Arkansas seeking higher education, but it's a work in progress. Uh, we said that 
22 years ago in the Lakeview case, education reform is a journey. It's not a destination. You've got to stay with it. And so uh, that was clearly the, the highest profile case that I've ever worked on. But there were other high profile cases in Benton County that I was you know, not a part of. One of them, uh, probably the one that drew the biggest crowds through the years was uh, a case against a man named Roger Dale Logan who was charged with the homosexual assault of the profoundly disabled children at the Sunshine School. And you talk about pitting two giants of trial law in Northwest Arkansas, David Klinger for the prosecution and John Everett, whom I believe to be your friend. John is from Prairie Grove, a great trial lawyer, and he represented Mr. Uh, Logan in the second trial. People would line up at the courthouse steps to get a seat in the large courtroom at Benton County to watch that trial. It was jam-packed, emotional, a crowd every day. And the testimony would bring tears to the eyes of people in the audience and even in the jury box. It was, it was a very high profile case. Uh, very high profile. What was the resolution of the case? He was convicted twice. Uh, he'd been convicted once and it got, uh, it got reversed for uh, a procedural error and tried again and he was convicted again. Uh, David Klinger was prepared. Um, you've talked a lot of stories about judges and sheriffs and lawyers. Are there anything, any stories that you remember that stand out maybe that I haven't asked about? Well, you've pretty well covered the waterfront with your questions about uh, cases that, that stand out, but uh, the history of Benton County law uh, is replete with funny moments, touching moments, sad moments, historic moments. I want to go back to Judge Enfield. Early in my law practice, the real most tragic event that happened in law enforcement ended up being a, an important and high profile case as well. There were three black transient uh, prisoners in the Benton County Jail who overpowered a deputy sheriff named Ed Rose and killed him. And of course the, that was a shocking event in Benton County. To have a, 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 sh a law enforcement officer killed in the jail, shocking. They were charged, Gary, Gary Kennan was the prosecutor. I'm not sure that I said that, but Gary Kennan was the prosecutor and, and so uh, he of course charged him with murder at, at about the same time that the death penalty came back into, uh, into being legal. You know, there was a period of time in the early 70s where the death penalty was ruled unconstitutional and then it, that law was changed and it became available again as, uh, as a remedy. The Southern Law Poverty Fund was so concerned that these three black inmates would not get a fair trial in Benton County that they sent a lawyer named Morris Dees. Morris Dees would later become very prominent as one of the primary fundraisers for Jimmy Carter when he was running for president and Morris Dees was, is and was legendary in the law, particularly in advocating for the disadvantaged. But he came to Benton County, Arkansas to be the defense lawyer against Gary Kennan for these three men that were charged with the crime. He came concerned that they would not get a fair trial. After being here for about a month, he satisfied himself that because of Judge William Enfield and his commitment to fairness and to justice and to the fact that these young men were going to get a fair trial, that he felt comfortable enough to remove himself from the case and allow other lawyers to proceed. Uh, and they, they did get a trial. They did not get the death penalty. They, they certainly got a, a severe penalty. I, I was, I, I, as I recall, it was life in prison. But the fact that a lawyer of national renown would come to Benton County with a suspicion that they would be railroaded and leave convinced 
they have a great judge who will give them a fair trial, who will see that all the rules are followed. That, I think, embodied the nature of practice law in Benton County. The judges have uniformly been good. Have they made errors in their decisions? Of course. Sometimes uh, uh, errors get committed. Uh, the greatest judges that ever were have all had their cases appealed and in some instances been reversed. But no one, to my knowledge, has ever been able to say that you don't get a fair trial in Benton County. You don't have an impartial judge. You do. The judges are good and they, to a person, male or female, Republican or Democrat or now nonpartisan, they have always been committing to, do, to doing the right thing. Who are some of the lawyers that you remember that stand out? You know, during during my career, I've had the opportunity to rub shoulders with a lot of lawyers. Uh, first, the ones that were much older than me, lawyers like Jeff Duty, uh, lawyers like J. Wesley Sampier. Uh, I've talked already about my friend Gene Kelly and, and uh, what he did for me. Uh, but then there are some other lawyers that have come along that are uh, that are young, younger than me, but just super lawyers. Uh, you know, I, I've not had a case against him, but I've worked with a young lawyer named Satch Oliver, and I'm telling you, he can try a lawsuit, but he can prepare a lawsuit too. But one of his sidelines is he works up mock trials, mock juries, so that trial lawyers, either for the defense or the prosecution, or a plaintiff's case, can basically submit their case to jurors, people that meet the demographics of the jury panel of wherever, whatever county you're in, and you present your case and you get some feel for what a jury might do. He's brilliant at that and uh, has been an aid to me in several cases and I know to lots of other uh, lawyers across the state of Arkansas. Of course, you can't talk about great trial lawyers in <coughs> in Benton County without talking about John Everett. Uh, I mentioned him earlier as being the defense lawyer in the in the uh, case involving the Sunshine School. John has the most facile mind of any person I've ever known. He, you, a witness makes a statement that John can latch on to and uh, there he goes. Now you got another 10 minutes of cross-examination and by the time he's done, the witness feels like he's been completely derobed. But even John got taken advantage of by a witness once. It's a story that he tells. I'm not, I'm not talking out of school. I, I've used it as an example many times about being careful what you say. In the very case that we talked about, the Roger Dale Logan case, uh, then prosecutor Klinger had finally gotten one of the one of the victims able to testify. A young, by that time he was in his young twenties, uh, he was profoundly disabled, uh, but he could talk. His name was Jimmy, and Jimmy got on the stand to testify about the things that had happened to him. Before he got to testify, Judge Enfield wanted to challenge, fairly, wanted to know, does he understand the obligation of the oath? And so he asked Jimmy, Jimmy, do you understand what it means to swear to tell the truth? And Jimmy looked at him and said, yes, Judge, God won't like it if you lie. And Judge Enfield said, he's qualified. And he began to testify, and his testimony was devastating to the defendant. John Everett, it it came his time to cross-examine. And he knew, as all good lawyers know, you can't beat up a witness that is infirm, elderly, uh, disabled. You, you, you can't not show compassion to a witness. And so John said, I couldn't just say no questions. I have to ask him something. So he went up and asked a few basic questions. And as he was finishing, John, in his colorful, theatric way, picked up his paper and started walking back to his desk, and he looked over his shoulder, and he said, thank you, Jimmy, for telling us your story today. And Jimmy leaned into the microphone and said, it ain't no story, Mr. Everett. It's the truth. And the audience 
exploded in applause. The jury was crying, and John says to me later, and when I sat down, I thought to myself, Roger Dale Logan, you're going to prison. It ain't no story, Mr. Everett. It's the truth. Unbelievable. Wow. Um, I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, any others? Any other prominent cases you can think of or memorable? I mean, I know there's tons of them, but any other ones that stand out? Well, uh, I, I, you know, you, you've asked, do I have memories of other cases that stand out? Uh, I guess I'm like most lawyers. The ones that I remember the most are the ones I lost, and it's painful to talk about them. Uh, but uh, there, there certainly have been some cases where uh, the, the jury didn't see things the way I did. Uh, but that, that just comes with when you, when you have a lawyer say to you, "I've never lost a case," he hadn't tried many. Well, you've lived in the county. Uh, my whole life. Your whole life. So, Seven, 71 years of living in this so, area. What can you say about the tremendous growth you've seen? I mean, that's kind of been one of the huge stories of the county. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that has made practicing law in Benton County profitable and enjoyable and varied has been this incredible growth that we've experienced that that really drove all all components of society it not only does it make traffic terrible it made our school systems overcrowded but our school systems responded I promise you this Rogers Bentonville Siloam Springs Pea Ridge Gentry Gravit Decatur all have great school systems but especially that's so in Rogers and Bentonville because the growth that has come has brought uh, has increased the tax base it's brought in um, folks with a with an understanding of the importance of education and that that has helped but as we talked about earlier it has also brought in folks that were that moved here from areas where there was a not a good education ethic and we've had an awful lot of kids present themselves at our doors that were not prepared for uh, the grade that, that they would be chronologically assigned to. All of the school districts, all of the school districts have worked hard to recognize the students that are behind and figure out a, a way to improve them and that's why the scores uh, are as, as excellent as they are in, in, in any ranking of school systems in the nation. Rogers and Bentonville, Siloam Springs, Pea Ridge in particular are going to rank very high uh, and that's not an accident. It's because the communities here have had an education ethic, they've elected good school board members, they've hired good superintendents who have hired good ed other administrators and have hired great teachers. Uh, and that in, it's sort of a hand in glove thing, Scott. Having a good education system has made it possible for the growth to be sustained. But you can measure, and as I look back at, you know, here in my life, I'm looking more through the rearview mirror than I am the windshield. The, the, the single thing that changed everything for Benton County was Beaver Lake. Absent Beaver Lake, you don't have the water supply to support the poultry industry. Absent Beaver Lake, you don't have the recreational opportunity to allow folks like Sam Walton to entice people to come and work at his, what was a five and dime store that turned into the largest corporation in America. Absent Beaver Lake, you don't have the, 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 the great resources that we've got to sustain the growth. Now you add to that some incredible individuals who saw the future of Benton County, people like Sam Walton, but you can't discount guys like J.B. Hunt and women like John L. Hunt either, and, and people like John A. Cooper Sr. who saw what could happen up here. So you have the rare combination of natural resources, a central location, a, a workforce, people that wanted to make their places better. I think of the group of Rogers businessmen 
who wanted to take this town from being a population of four or five thousand into a, into a growing community. They knew they had to have some manufacturing jobs. So the business people, not the government, the business people got together and went on a field trip to Michigan to entice a guy named Cass Huff to locate Daisy Manufacturing in Rogers. And when he did that, he brought with him a whole set of folks like uh, Gerald and Kay King and many others who moved down here from Michigan and brought with them a commitment to education. Lots of folks don't remember that Dave Gates, who was an executive at Daisy, came here from Michigan with Daisy, but he'd served a number of years as the chairman of the school board in Rogers during a time of, of growth and expansion and helped instill this education ethic that I keep uh, talking about. We've just been blessed here with good people, Beaver Lake, the beautiful uh, land that we live on, and then the opportunities for folks. It, it's, it's been a wonderful place to live, to grow, to grow a law practice. Uh, but I'd still twitch my nose and take us back to 1968 if I could. Um, a couple more questions here. Do you have anything else you want to say before I wrap these up? Nope, I'm ready to wrap up too. All right. Uh, if somebody who'd never been to Benton County came to you, and some of this you've already talked about, and said, what's your home county like? What would you tell them? If I were asked by a stranger to describe Benton County, I would say it is a place where anybody that wants to work hard can succeed. I would say it's a place where you have uh, the opportunity to worship however you want to worship, or if you don't want to worship. I'd say it's a place where if you want to have recreational activities, they are abundant. You have a lake that's wonderful to fish on, to swim in, to boat on. We now have, thanks to the generosity and vision of the youngest generation of Waltons, we now have a world-class biking opportunity that's, that's available for people of all ages, a place to walk, a place to bike. My wife and I, I'm 71 and she's 68, and we just bought e-bikes. An e-bike means, that's a fancy word for it, it's an electric bicycle that helps you pedal. But it's opened up great opportunities for us that to, you know, to get out and to stay active. The Bella Vista community provides ample opportunity for socialization of folks in their retirement years and for golfing opportunities, but also affordable housing for young families. You know, it, it's been a tremendous uh, addition to Benton County. Uh, Benton County just offers it all. It's got it's centrally located to the United States. It's got an excellent uh, airport. It's got excellent. Uh, interstate highways to get you where you want to go by by car or if you're selling goods by truck uh, we have the benefit of the railroad that's what brought the rogers into being in the first place it's just it's the place where you can live out and fulfill the american dream 